This podcast is for entertainment purposes only and does not substitute for professional medical advice. Please seek a medical professional or healthcare provider if you're seeking any medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Thanks, everyone. Hello. Hi. <laughs> hi, everyone. Everyone that's listening. Yes. Hi. <laughs> I feel like weird starting this one off. Why? I don't know. I don't know. Anyway. All right. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome back. She, she Jules and just I really started. It. <laughs> yeah, I know. We're just I was thinking about food. That. That's why. <laughs> yeah, Jules was thinking about food, so she was like, "Hi." Yeah. Hello. Still thinking about food. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we are back on our recap. Yes. So your face. I know this is my favorite. Yes. I love it. I just love learning about new things. There was um, a lot of cool ones for this one. Yeah, I know. A I'm lot excited. of cool ones. Yeah. I'm excited. So for those of you that don't know, this is our August recap. We just review latest medical news, research, just articles, things that are interesting that involve something with medicine. Just takes a break from our other podcast when it's more about like learning about something specific. Yeah. So I really enjoy this. We hope that you guys really enjoy yeah. it. So let's start it off. Go ahead. All right. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is. Oh, I'm going to start this one. Okay. Okay. Because it's I all did... about the Marine. Yeah. And I did a uh, TikTok on it. Oh, okay. Find okay. it on our page. It's there. Oh, yes. Specifically on this one. Yes. Yes. Wow. Yes. This is <clears throat> up her. Thank God. Start off. With <laughs> Go for it, Jules. <laughs> That's why I'm like, hold on. Yeah. Hold on a second. Yeah. I became a little bit of an expert on this one. <laughs> anyway, so... No thanks. <laughs> so, nerve fibers in the brain could generate quantum entanglement. So this puts together the brain and physics all in one. Jules is <laughs> looking at me through the camera, and I'm already like, all right, moving on. Yeah. Moving on. Zoning out. Zoning immediately. out. Immediate zone out. I'm just like... <laughs> You're definitely, if you're watching this video, yeah. you're going to just see Evie's eyes just glaze over just and glaze like, over in a sentence. I'm like thinking about anything else. Anything. Just the word quantum entanglement. I'm like, yeah, okay, pass. <laughs> but anyways, this is actually really interesting for a lot of people. It really is. I'm going to try and pay attention. Okay. Okay. So by Carmela Padovic Callahan on July 31st, 2024 on The New Scientist. Scientists have discovered that nerve fibers in the brain might create pairs of particles that are connected through a phenomenon called quantum entanglement. And quantum entanglement on its own is like a massive, very, very difficult thing to explain. So I'm just going to like reduce it to a very, very short sentence, try to keep you just just follow me here. Yeah, okay? I need it. I need it. Okay, so quantum entanglement is a mysterious process. So we're just going to keep it as a mysterious process because it's just too much where particles become linked. So particles just they, mm -hmm. they become linked right so that state of one so like let's say you have one in uh, like on this desk right you have yeah. a particle on my desk right and then the state of that like it's linked to something else that's like in another room on my bed okay okay all right, all right. so we have one particle on my desk another one in the bed behind me right okay but these two things are linked, are linked somehow, mysteriously mysterious okay. some way some way somehow they're linked right check out the talk i go a little bit more in depth than that but anyway so the the state of that one that's on the desk for some reason mm -hmm. if i roll it mm -hmm. that influences the other one. the other one mm -hmm. they're linked somehow yeah so if i roll it that one's probably gonna roll too, roll too. or okay. something's gonna happen to okay. it, you know so that's pretty much what quantum entanglement is in a very 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 crude simple term i love it you know mm -hmm. so and that means that it could be anywhere i'm saying like in the same room but it doesn't have to be that particle could be in my desk or it could be in switzerland it's still linked and whatever i do to this one particle that one's getting affected somehow okay that blows my mind yes. how does that happen why does that happen I what the fuck that if you really go down that rabbit hole it's like i don't want to go down that rabbit hole but if you do it's like no because i'm probably gonna get stuck there <laughs> and i'm gonna be lost <laughs> lost in a place that i probably don't want to be in then that means like how many things can you manipulate and you don't even know yeah 
Okay, so what about this connection in the brain? Right. So then now that you have that very like simplified version of what the hell is quantum entanglement, that's what it is. So this could be groundbreaking discovery because it might explain how millions of brain cells or neurons manage to synchronize their activity in our brain. So just just to clarify what Jules is saying, mm. quantum entanglement is actual is actually discussed in physics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? exactly. So this, this is, is not physics. like a, a mysterious thing that we found. No, 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 no. No, this is physics and you can look into it. Quantum entanglement is actually a thing that is discussed yeah. in a lot of different aspects of physics. So now yeah. basically they are starting to connect quantum entanglement into medicine. And right now we're talking about nerve fibers. Exactly. Because yeah. that's what I'm saying. Like if you go down that rabbit hole, of which we just talked about phantom limb so could this be quantum entanglement oh my god i am <laughs> using physics oh my god i'm so proud of myself you see the first time in my life i'm interested in physics you see <laughs> that's it excitement over god damn it anyway, short -lived. it was very short-lived but at least i got a little bit of it you see yeah. what i mean if you go down that rabbit hole how many Things can it affect? Check out our episode on Phantom Limb on yes. Patreon. But it's anyways, okay, moving on. So it might explain how these, how millions of brain cells or neurons manage to synchronize their activity inside our brain, right? We have millions of them and they're one of, you know, tiny, tiny, tiny microscopic cells and they all manage to just work all together all at the same time in our brain, one in the front, in the frontal lobe and the other one in our freaking cerebellum. How does that work? How are they able to like yeah. so quickly communicate amongst each other, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's, I mean, they're trying to find how does that happen? So when our brain is active, millions of neurons fire at the same time and they need to coordinate this firing even if they are far apart from each other, right? So researchers like Yong Kong Chan from Shanghai University suggest that quantum entanglement could be the mechanism that allows this long distance coordination. If future experiments confirm this idea, it could significantly change our understanding of how the brain works and how it even processes information. Still so crazy. Yeah. I mean, honestly, like, <laughs> I'm more of like a concrete person. Julia is definitely more of the like abstract, like abstract which I think that's what balances us out yeah. a lot. <laughs> but I, I will say nothing is impossible in medicine. Mm-mm. Truly, there yeah. are miracles that happen. Yeah. If you believe in miracles, then you'll probably believe in quantum entanglement. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah. And, yeah. And I do believe in miracles. And yeah. quantum entanglement, I feel like, is something, you know, it's not concrete, but that's what physics is. Yeah. It's not really concrete. So right. it's really hard for people like me to, like, see it, right? It's like I need to see it to believe it, but that is the, that's what... A perfect example is gravity. Yeah. You know, you can't see it, but it's 100% there. So, All right, cool. So that's, I mean, right. I could talk about this forever. Yeah, I know. Jules <laughs> is like ready to have a full blown like tea time with me. I'm trying to convince this. you here. Uh, yeah. And I'm like, come on. It ain't man. happening, girl. <laughs> it ain't happening. Yeah. Never right. was, never will be a physics person. Go ahead, take the next one. All right, moving on. <laughs> yeah. So, which antidepressant causes most weight gain? Okay, this is hot. Yeah. All right, because yeah. Lord knows everyone is really iffy about certain medications mm -hmm. and not just antidepressants, no, you know, yeah. birth control, all these things, right? 100%. Weight is always going to be an issue that's discussed. So this is a new study that offers maybe some answers. So this is by Sherry Gordon on July 23rd, 2024 on health.com. So a recent study looked at how different antidepressants affect weight gain. Well, most, that's one of the most common side effects. The researchers have reviewed that health records of 183,000 people in the U.S. and tracked their weight for two years. They found that Lexapro users gained the most weight, about an average of 14 pounds in six months and 3.6 pounds. 1.4 pounds. Oh, okay. I was going to say, I'm like, why is it more than that? Okay, I missed the dot. Okay. Yeah, I was like, 14 so, pounds, binga. Yeah. <laughs> People are going to be like, no, it's like the Fuck that. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so they found that Lexapro users gained the most weight, about 1.4 pounds in six months and 3.6 pounds in two years. No, I didn't know that about Lexapro. Like, I think that's a very big, like, SSRI thing, though. Yeah, no, for sure. But, yeah. like, that Lexapro was so, like, the, known. The one, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
On the other hand, well, butrin, mm. okay, users gained the least. So with no weight gain at six months and about one pound after two years. So experts explain that the weight gain from the antidepressants might be due to increased serotonin levels, which can boost your appetite and cravings for carbs. So antidepressants might also slow down your metabolism and make people less active. The so weight gain is important to consider when choosing an antidepressant because it can worsen health conditions like diabetes and heart disease. It can also impact self-esteem and mental health. However, weight gain isn't really the only factor to consider, right? Right. So doctors also look at the person's like symptoms, the medical history and other conditions. Despite the concerns about weight gain, it's really crucial for people with depression or yeah. anxiety to seek treatment. And again, guys, we're talking about 1.4 pounds, 3.6 yeah. pounds. It's not a lot. It's not crazy, yeah, yeah, okay? Yeah. I, I feel like a lot of benefits outweigh that risk. Untreated depression can lead to really serious health problems. It's really important to not avoid the treatment due to fear of weight gain. 100%. Cool. 100%. All right. China unveils the world's first AI hospital with robot doctors capable of treating 3,000 patients. It's crazy. <laughs> it's like... It's crazy. On August 5th <clears throat> by Intels.com. So the world's first AI hospital named Agent Hospital has been unveiled in China. This groundbreaking facility developed by researchers from, I'm going to try my best here, guys, um, Tsinghua mm -hmm. University in Beijing. That's what I would say. Yeah. yeah. Can treat up to 3,000 patients a day using robot doctors. The hospital is expected to be operational by the second half of 2024, so probably now, after just six months of research and development. That's a little scary. But then again, we're talking about China. So, I mean, I don't know. That's very short time in research and preparing and whatever. But anyway, you do you. Uh, Liu Yang, the research team leader, highlighted that the AI hospital will greatly benefit both medical professionals and the general public. The AI doctors can treat up to 10,000 patients in just a few days, a task that would take human doctors at least two years to accomplish. Tests have shown that these AI doctors have a 93.06% accuracy rate on MedQ data set, which includes U.S. medical licensing exam questions. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait until I finish. The AI doctors can handle major respiratory diseases and can simulate the entire medical process from consultation and examination to diagnosis, treatment, and follow-up. This virtual hospital has the potential to save millions of lives through its advanced autonomous capabilities. What are your opinions on this? Okay. Exam, exams are not everything for, for a doctor. I So I just feel that this is okay they're talking and they're boasting about the first world robot run hospital but i feel like this is totally treating the patient as a robot yeah yeah right yeah exactly it's like so i actually feel that ai and medicine can help a lot right but it's an assist but it's an assistance exactly yeah. so i can imagine it you know like kind of Maybe, you know, like helping me with like a history, right? Like when a patient says right. a lot of history, right. maybe AI can kind of condense it and take out the yeah. fluff and like really condense something. And then that can help me save time for this. 100%. Maybe organization as well. Because mm -hmm. sometimes the symptoms are so disorganized. Timeline is so disorganized. Yep. So like filtering things filtering out. Filtering things out, you know, exactly. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So totally. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And maybe even using AI to be like, here's the latest research, right? Mm. On all these things. I, I feel like that can only empower a lot of 100%. doctors, right? Yeah. But just totally, just 100% run. It's what? So, I mean, if I go in, I'm like, well, I had fever, right for i don't know four days and i don't know maybe the machine goes and looks inside my ear and then like goes and i don't know what what is it exactly that it's doing i'm not too sure i've never yeah. been to like, a whole entire hospital nobody has robots. It's, yeah it's gonna be the first one and it's pretty scary i think it's yeah i think it's it's interesting to see however like medicine is an art yes it's yes. not just textbook, like what they're saying, that it's 93% accurate by test taking, whatever it is that means. Yeah, it was the MedQA data set, which includes U.S. Like medical licensing. licensing exam and... questions. But we know, and you know, yeah. how that is just one portion 
like yeah. a portion. It's not the whole entire thing of becoming a doctor. Exactly. So then what I'm concerned about is that let's just say this robot, right, mm -hmm. treats something, mm -hmm. right? There's still, so this 93%, right? We're still talking about that 7% mm -hmm. that maybe something else. And then this patient comes back and then sees a real person. They're like, well, I didn't really do your initial exam. And, you know, I, I just, I don't feel like everything is just so black and white. Mm -hmm. So I, yes, medicine, there's a lot of things that we call textbook medicine. Yeah, but. Right. However, I think what not... it can, it doesn't, it's not always like that. Right. Half the time, I'm the person getting the history. Right. Because patients are like, oh, I didn't really think about that. And then, I'm, you know, so that's the whole entire <laughs> art of things that you're kind of like maneuvering to see like what's the best kind of information you can get. Right. And I just don't think a robot can do that. No, no. This a is... robot is only going to do what you give it. Exactly. Right. And exactly. so, like, 10 out of 10, I'm getting more from my patients because of the questions that I'm asking. Yeah, yeah. Know? And it's just the human aspect is a big factor in medicine, uh -huh. you know, because you're treating a human. So it's like, I don't know, this feels like a very black mirror type of episode, yeah, it's very <laughs> you know, and I get it. Like, it's going to significantly reduce the costs for these hospitals. And however it is that healthcare works in China, I'm sure that it's going to reduce a lot of their costs because now it's not paying for like per doctor yeah. or per patient or whatever. It's like, look at how many they were talking about how many per day, 3000 3, patients, patients a day. A day. Oh, and we know that China has one of the largest populations in the world. Yeah. So I get the whole thing of like trying to be efficient and whatever, but come on. But let's just say something happens. That's it. What happens if something happens? So who takes fault? Like the robot? What? You're just going to unplug the robot and we're never going to use that robot ever again? Like, mm -hmm. what? <laughs> no, they'll just, it, it'll be a software thing. They'll have to re, re I know, but like what happens if an, a complication happens with the patient? Mm -hmm. Who's going to be responsible for that? The I'm not going to review 3,000 charts i see what you mean i see who reviews yeah. the patients what, and at the end of the day yeah, we're, that's yeah. what we're counting on right like someone needs to review that robot right but we don't know i that's don't know weird. that's so weird we don't know because this might just be completely based on unless someone signs off like hey i'm getting treated by a robot it's up to make all my responsibility right you you probably are signing away your life there of yeah. like you know it's all it's all software based yeah. like nobody's really going to review it it's all based on software you don't you know, know what's sad is that there's people that are like, yeah, okay, whatever. Well, yeah, th and that's what I'm saying. This is probably first, this is my opinion. I don't know. This is just the summary that I got from intel.com. But I could see how this could easily be used to treat people with low income or or very, very heavily, heavily, densely populated yeah, areas, areas yeah. you know, and stuff like that. We're not talking about the rich or like the one percenters or whatever of China are yeah. going to go to these hospitals exactly. treating 3,000 patients yeah. a day by. No, you know, yeah. that's not I don't see how that translates. Yeah. They're going to go totally to their private doctors. I'm not against AI in medicine. I'm just no. I don't think that I'm fully ready to accept like, a robot just treating people. That's it. No, no, and no. Yeah. And taking no responsibility that that. And then again, what came crazy to me about that was the six months of research and development. Six, yeah, months. six months okay it takes here like okay. no rush don't worry it takes us for the fda to approve a medication like 10 years or more yeah and you're saying that in six months we got an ai hospital yeah i know it's weird i don't know anyway there's something weird there yeah yeah anyway uh all right you. <laughs> I so, did the AI hospital <laughs> yeah all right so, fda approves nasal spray as first needle-free treatment for anaphylaxis okay so this came out on August 9, 2024 by Reuters on NBC News. So the FDA has approved the first nasal spray for treating severe allergic reactions. So if you all didn't know, we used to, well, we still use epinephrine, like the EpiPen, um, for severe anaphylactic reactions. So this new nasal spray called Nephi, love the word already, love the name, <laughs> uh, contains epinephrine, the same medication found in EpiPens, but it's delivered through the nose instead of the injection. This could make it a lot easier for people to use during emergencies. The nasal spray is designed to be simple, quick, providing a new option for those with severe allergies. Awesome. I need it. Yeah. yeah awesome. Give it to me. Like Amazing. It's An injection is really, yeah. it's very intense. Yeah. I know a lot of people that inject themselves by mistake. Okay. Oh, yeah. We went through a whole yeah. like, Check out our previous episodes don't, on people that. People that don't inject because they're afraid that they're yeah. going to do it incorrectly. 100%. And an injection is like big for them, right? 
I can. And then a lot of parents that just that, that don't know what to do, they're like freaking out, panicking. So I just feel like a nasal spray, just shh, shh, that's it. And the thing about the injection too, it's like, oh my God, where do I inject? Like yeah. and throughout the whole body, where do I put this? You know, whatever. Yeah, and there's a lot of training, right? There's actually EpiPens that talk to you. You said that, yeah. Yes, there's EpiPens that is like, open the bounds, put it on here, you know, yeah. put it, whatever, like perpendicular to the but side I mean, of your thigh. There's no mistaking a nasal spray. A nasal spray. spray. Yeah. That's it. It's going to go in the nose, that's it. I feel like you that's going to be a really big game changer. It's going to be we great. We have a lot of, uh, we use a lot of nasal sprays to for right. like breakthrough seizures and things like that, which is very, so much more easier than putting something under the tongue of a patient or mm. like diastat that's rectal. So it's, these things are, I'm, I'm really happy that we're starting to create new medications that are r much more user-friendly. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So massive biomolecular shifts occur in our 40s and 60s. Stanford Medicine, researchers find. This was all over my feed. I could not get away from this news article. Like I couldn't. So I'm like, okay, obviously we'll, we'll talk about it. So by Rachel Tampa on August 14th, 2024, published on Stanford Medicine News Center. The study of theirs reveals that our bodies undergo significant biological changes in our 40s and 60s. Researchers found that various molecules and microorganisms crucial for health shift dramatically around ages 44 and 60. Only nine years away from me for the first one. 90? Oh, nine. yeah, yeah, 44, nine. 44, yeah, yeah, yeah. For the first yeah, one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then I get on 60. Anyway, these changes affect cardiovascular health, immune function, and metabolism. The study published in Nature Aging shows that these shifts are not gradual but occur in bursts. Both men and women experience these changes, indicating factors beyond menopause. For example, in the 40s, changes relate to alcohol and caffeine metabolism, I mean, I'm already experiencing that. I'm only 35. <laughs> it, while in the 60s, it affects carbohydrate metabolism and immune regulation. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So these findings suggest that lifestyle factors like stress, alcohol consumption might influence these shifts. The researchers recommend proactive health measures such as regular exercise and moderate alcohol intake to maintain health as we age. I mean, um... yeah. I mean, when have you joined us on a podcast that we don't say eating healthier and doing exercise is going to be better for you? I think like in almost every episode we We're mentioned mentioning something like that. Exercise and sleep. Is yeah, like... exercise, sleep, healthy eating. <laughs> don't eat plastic. <laughs> Which is almost impossible these days. I know. It's I, I saw like I didn't I didn't have time to include it here, but they found microplastics in brain. Um, awesome. Great. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. Yeah. yeah you awesome. Know? It was already in sperm. Now it's in the brain. So, you know, great. it's great. Love it. Anyway, so cool. that's the world we live in. <laughs> Next up, cognitive motor dissociation and disorders of consciousness. So this was the one that I had sent to you, right? Yeah. So really cool. I just know if you want a full episode on this, I'm totally you get there. I'm not kidding. Oh, wow. Are we doing ASMR now? No, but I mean, we could. <laughs> 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 okay, so I sent this article to Julie because I thought this was really cool, and I feel like this is all up Julie's super up my alley. Alley, yeah. So this is by uh, Yelena G. Bodian. She is a PhD doctor, and all her friends published <laughs> on August 14. Every time we say all their friends, it's et al. Et al. So for those of you that don't know, anytime that you have a published article or something like that there's like a lot of people your group they say et al yeah it could be a lot of a people a lot of so. people so we just say then they're friends That's all. Uh -huh. so this was published on august 14 2024 on the new england journal of medicine which is pretty great yeah the article cognitive motor dissociation and disorders of consciousness this explores a condition where patients appear unresponsive but may still have cognitive awareness how can i explain it? it's like a person in a coma Right. Right. They are perceived to be unconscious, mm -hmm. but actually they are, their brain waves are still listening and everything. Okay. So this phenomenon known as cognitive motor dissociation occurs in individuals with severe brain injuries who are diagnosed with disorders of consciousness, such as a vegetative state or a minimally conscious state. The authors discussed how advanced neuroimaging and electrophysiological techniques can detect signs of awareness in these patients challenging the traditional diagnostic methods right so before it was kind of like they're in a vegetative state they yeah. cannot hear you they cannot feel anything all these things but now they're starting to take images that there's potentially yeah still things working so even though they are not awake uh-huh they are still some level of awake 
okay? That's just so... Take, take a deep breath, okay? There's so many, like, movies and yes, things, like, based on stuff like that. I know, I know. I don't even want to... <laughs> so weird. Recognizing CMD, which is, again, the cognitive motor dissociation, is crucial because it could influence a patient's care decisions and rehab strategies, offering hope for people improved outcomes by identifying those who may benefit from targeted therapies. Yeah. The study emphasizes the importance of accurate diagnosis and the potential for technology to uncover this hidden cognitive function, thereby improving quality of life for patients and severe brain injuries. This reminds me of a patient that I had when I was a resident, and she had, bless you, sorry, and this patient had what we called locked-in syndrome. We should totally do an episode on locked-in syndrome. Oh, yeah, yeah. This patient had locked-in syndrome. She had suffered a lot of... What's locked-in syndrome in simple terms? So locked-in syndrome is basically when you are not able to react to the outside. So, like, you're, you're aware of everything, but you're locked in. You don't have motor movements. You don't have, like, anything. Like the movie, uh, Get Out. Kind of. Yeah. You saw that earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you are fully aware. Okay. You're fully aware of everything that's going on. You can hear, you can think, you can do everything, but you are literally locked into your body. Like you cannot talk, you cannot move, you cannot do anything. Yeah. So we had a patient that she unfortunately had a lot of brain traumas from bleeds that she had. And she ended up developing a type of locked in syndrome. Mm. And I will never forget, she had surgery, mm-hmm. right? Um, and it, she had surgery for like an orthopedic surgery, mm-hmm. right? And we noticed that on her vitals, she always was tachycardic, mm-hmm. so palpitations. Her blood pressure was up. Mm-hmm. You know, we couldn't figure it out. We were like searching like DVTs. We were doing like all these exams to just see yeah, like yeah, yeah. what was the cause yeah, and right. everything was negative. And we were all just like this, you know, she has to be like in some sort of pain. Maybe she's in pain and like her vitals are the ones that are cueing us that she's in pain. And then, you know, she had these casts from the orthopedic surgery and we're like, let's take off the cast and and check and see. And I will never forget that as they were doing the cast removal, Uh I saw tears coming down her eyes because I was in the room. That would break me. And no, I I asked the surgeons, I asked ortho to stop. And oh my God, I would, I I don't. And they didn't understand why I was asking them to stop. And obviously I'm not here to tell like a specialist, please stop what you're doing. Cause they're like, what? Like we can't just stop, you know? And I was just like, we need to, we, we need to like push more like pain management, Mm -hmm. pain control. Cause she was crying. And sometimes I almost felt like she was trying to moan almost because of the pain. Oh my God. And I just, so I think of this and I'm like, we really need more push for this kind of medicine. Yes. Yes. Because there's something there are, happening there. There's, there's something happening. Yeah. They're awake. They're aware. They hear us. They know what's happening, but they cannot, they cannot physically sit up in the chair and be like, Shh, stop. Right. What so crazy out no they stopped they stopped obviously with the patient no we ended up seeing i, I think it was the the casts yeah just the the position of the casts mm. were just like the way that they were sitting remember she was she couldn't move or anything like that so we checked thankfully everything was okay she didn't have anything you know causing that um, and she ended up actually getting better oh, after they adjusted the cast good, and good. stuff like that okay um, so it was something something without, probably related yeah. to pain exactly. yeah exactly uh, but I will never, ever, ever forget that. It makes me want to, like, keep deep breathing. Like, oh, yes. my God. But I read this kind of article. Yeah. And this is, it just, the first thing I thought about was this patient. Of course. And I'm, it's, you know, a lot of the time we tell families, hey, they're not there. They're not feeling anything. Jesus. And it's not true. And this is finally like we're seeing images, electrical proof. waves, proof that there is something there. They potentially may be hearing you. Mm-hmm. They potentially do feel something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is just, it, it was just, I, I wanted this to be on that news recap so much because I just thought it was so cool to finally see that 
whoa, wait a minute, everything that we've been thinking before is not. And this is what I love about medicine is that we are constantly learning. This is just learning all the time. Mm -hmm. I always joke around with yeah. Julie, like we're never going to have no. like zero content. I know. Because <laughs> it's just, it's like an ever like evolving yeah. field yeah, yeah. and so much to learn from everyone from all around the world. And it's just crazy, guys. It, it really is. Now imagine using quantum entanglement to help that. Move it on. Come on. It, it, you what? know, if it exists in that patient's mind, it could exist somewhere else. So then they could communicate it somewhere else. I mean, I totally see where you're going. You see where I'm going? But you see I how get, the rabbit hole is so but big? I need like the imaging. You see how they mentioned here, like imaging, electric waves. That's what I'm saying. Like it could, it, like they could make it. How about that? You could measure it. Just as they're measuring like brain waves and whatever. How about we translate those brain waves into something that you could understand. I'm gonna need like a whole entire, I'm, I'm gonna have to go back to school for physics. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want to, <laughs> so don't make me do that. All right, so this one's from our home. And this one, Mario sent it to me. Whoop, whoop. Not, not very whoop, whoop. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> I'm gonna stop but the shoulder very, tricks. very unbrand for Miami. Super unbrand for Miami. Oh my God, I want to know what's going on. Oh my God, I can't believe you didn't know Sword about this. Hell. Okay. Oh no, I do know about this. Yeah. Actually, yeah. now that I'm reading. He's a POS of a person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, the CEO who made a fortune while his I, hospital. I worked, I worked in uh, something related to what we're going to talk about right now. Yeah. And this is, this is really juicy. Oof. All right, so here we go. CEO who made a fortune while his hospital chain collapsed. Very unbred for Miami. Super. Yeah. Anyway, by Jonathan Wheel on August 18, 2024, published on the Wall Street Journal. I had first seen this on MedPage and then it's just gone everywhere. This yeah. guy's getting flamed. And oh, yeah. Good. You know, anyway, so Stewart Healthcare System, a large healthcare company, recently filed for bankruptcy, making it the biggest healthcare system to fail in decades. While the company was losing hundreds of millions of dollars each year, its CEO, Ralph de la Torre, was paid at least $250 million over four years. This situation has drawn significant attention and criticism. As the financial situation of Stewart worsened, the conditions uh, in its hospitals became increasingly dire. During this time, De La Torre's lavish lifestyle came under scrutiny. Reports revealed that he owns two expensive boats, including a $40 million yacht and a $15 million sport fishing boat as well as a $7.2 million ranch in Texas. Nice. Nice. Must be nice. I'm being an asshole that doesn't care. But yep. anyway, a Senate committee is investigating De La Torre and had subpoenaed him to testify next month. Additionally, Massachusetts Governor Ma Maura Healy has called for a federal investigation after Stewart announced the closure of two hospitals in the state. This announcement coincided with De La Torre's attending equestrian events at the Palace of Versailles in Paris. Governor Healy accused De La Torre of misusing company funds for personal luxuries, like going to Versailles, um, at the expense of workers and patients. De La Torre, however, has disputed the claim, stating that the value of his assets has been exaggerated. His spokesperson mentioned that he was on a pre-planned family vacation when the hospital closures were announced. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not going to mention the place where I worked, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But I will just say, Mr. De La Torres, okay, mm -hmm. while you were off in Versailles, okay, your hospital was pretty much shutting down in unsafe manners. So I, we were still taking deliveries, even though we didn't have an ICU, oh my we God. didn't have a nursery, we didn't have anything and we were still expected that if a mother presented to give birth and the baby was born, that we would have to assume some sort of responsibility. Luckily, I was able to get out of that. But I think actually a lot of physicians wrote letters and they actually ended up just shutting down everything all together. But I was... How are you oh God, how, going to... How do you have the conscience to do that, you know? While you're, yeah, while you're parting it up, people's lives are at stake. Yeah. Right? Patients and the workers having yep. to deal with all Patients that. Patients and the workers. And a lot of people were laid off during that. I know we're talking about like patient safety and everything, but also the employees. We're talking yeah. about a lot of employees 
that were promised bonuses Jeez. on sign so people's livelihoods right yeah and then they started kind of dispersing them into other stored system but all of them really just closed yeah. yeah so obviously this is all ongoing right now i am just stating the facts from the wall street journal this is what was in that article but how could you say that your assets have been exaggerated mm -hmm. when you have those boats those yachts yeah. those vacations go on and on and on i mean it's kind of like proof in the pudding right so yeah. anyway so purdue calls more than 167 thousand pounds of frozen chicken nuggets nuggies i know the chicken nuggies and tenders the tendies yeah due to possible metal wire in them awesome Super super scary so this is by ap news um, and it was released august 19 2024 um, and the article came from uh cbs news but it's on everywhere mm -hmm. so purdue foods has issued a recall for more than 167,000 pounds of frozen chicken nuggets and tenders due to reports of metal wires being found inside the products this recall Torture. affects three specific products purdue breaded chicken tenders the butcher box organic chicken breast nuggets and Purdue Simply Smart Organics breaded chicken breast nuggets. Jesus Christ. I okay. eat those. Yeah. <laughs> so these items have a best if used by date of March 23rd, 2025. And it can be identified by establishing the establishment number P33944 on the package. And they were pretty much sold nationwide. The U.S. Agriculture Departments of Food and Safety and Inspection Services, so the FSIS and Purdue, received several customer complaints which led to the discovery of the metal wire. Although no injuries or adverse reactions have been reported, the recall is being conducted as a precautionary measure. They always say that. Mm. Consumers who have purchased these products have been advised to either dispose of them or return them to the store for a full refund. And obviously, just so that you guys know, Purdue has provided their contact information, 866-866-3703 for anyone if they find some metal wiring. <laughs> Or just a question of what the fuck. Just throw it away, guys. <laughs> just throw it away. Seriously. Anyway. Next one. Severe COVID linked to mental illness in weeks, months after infection by Katherine Kahn on MedPage Today, August 21st, 2024. We don't talk a lot about COVID in our podcast because I feel like COVID is so... It's still so unknown. There's so much unknown about it. So there's a lot... Highly polarizing topic. It's turned political. Political, polarizing. Like, I don't know why medicine has to become politicized. It just doesn't, it, there's, politics should not have a place in medicine, yeah. in my opinion. No, I, I you know, agree. so, yeah. and that's why we've kind of like not talked about COVID much, although there's always news on COVID. Yeah. Um, but this one was not politically charged and there was, you know, it's something that's mental yeah, things health. Things that we need to talk about. Yeah, it's mental yeah. health, you know, and this is important because a lot of people like go through this and they're just like, anyway, so let's get into it. I'm by Catherine Kahn on MedPage Today, August 21st, 2024. Individuals who in, um, experience severe COVID-19 infections are at heightened risk of developing mental health problems such as depression, anxiety, and other serious mental health illnesses in the weeks and months following their infection. This risk is particularly pronounced among those who were unvaccinated at the time of infection. So the study emphasizes that the unvaccinated individuals who contract COVID-19 are more susceptible to experiencing psychological distress and mental health disorders. This suggests that vaccination may play a protective role, not only in preventing severe physical illness, but also in mitigating the psychological impacts of COVID-19. The findings underscore the importance of vaccination as a preventative me measure against both physical and mental health consequences of COVID-19. Public health strategies should focus on increasing vaccination rates to reduce the incidence of severe COVID-19 cases and the associated mental health issues. So overall, this article just calls to the attention to the significant mental health challenges that can arise after severe COVID-19 infections, particularly among the unvaccinated. So, yeah, I mean, it's mental health, right? Yeah. Um, just keep an eye out if you, I mean, COVID has very much changed th these days from what it used to be back in 2020, mm -hmm. but there are still plenty 
of cases yeah. of COVID-19. So yeah. it's something that should be talked about because it's not yeah. only the coughing, the dangers of it, you know, the, no, the physical aspects, there's and, no yeah, mental health to play. Exactly. And COVID can also have long COVID. So yeah. symptoms that can last more than just that acute phase of COVID when you're sick. Yeah. There are a lot of things. There are a lot of articles. There are a lot of people complaining yeah. about things that happen to and them it's still after developing. COVID. And it's still, yeah. And we're still learning a lot about that. I think it's really cool. There's also some articles showing that vaccinations also decrease the chances of long COVID. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of things that play into COVID. Again, this is a pandemic that happened very recently, even though it was back in 2020. Yeah, 2020. There's still a lot of things that we're learning about COVID. Yeah. But just it's just another thing to talk about when yeah. when we're talking about COVID. Yeah, yeah. And now there's everybody's always so I mean, focused. there's clinics literally dedicated to yeah. just post-COVID symptoms. It makes sense. It yeah. makes sense. And it's something that's still developing. It's still being studied. There's yeah. a lot of things that's and still real, like, right? Like, it's real. It's real things that like we're getting data on. 100%. So, and I know that again, that could be like highly political. But highly, we're not talking about the highly, political. What you call it? Conspiracy theory. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But this is, you know. What, These are just the facts. facts. And now yeah. there's a mental health aspect to it that yeah. has come across, you yeah. know, researchers. So yeah. it's more than just the physical. And then there's a mental health factor to it so pay attention to that guys yeah. all right so intermittent fasting shows promising in multiple sclerosis so by judy george on MedPage today august 21st 2024 so recent studies suggest that intermittent fasting may be of benefit for people with multiple sclerosis by improving immune function and reducing inflammation so this study found that fasting led to a decrease in pro-inflammatory immune cells and leptin levels a hormone linked to hunger and metabolism that is often elevated in MS patients. I didn't know that either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so interesting. Additionally, fasting positively influenced the gut microbiome, increasing beneficial bacteria. So although these findings are promising, the study was pretty small and further research needs to confirm all these results and explore fasting as a potential complementary treatment for MS. Yeah. So this is really great. It's just like seizures, intractable seizures. A lot of people go on a ketogenic diet because mm -hmm. it helps with that. Um, and we're talking about people, like I had patients that had failed a lot of anticonvulsants for epilepsy right. and then just being on a keto diet completely changed that. That's incredible. So it's crazy. But it just comes to show like how important the gut health. The gut health is, yeah. And how it influences so much, you yeah. know? All right. So one of your favorite things. <laughs> <laughs> intestinal parasites may reduce COVID-19 vaccine effectiveness. Gross. It is gross. By Grace Wade on August 21st on The New Scientist. So research suggests that intestinal parasites, which affect 25% of the global population, could reduce the effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines. This finding comes from a study conducted on mice. The presence of these parasites may interfere with the immune response triggered by the vaccine. This highlights the importance of considering parasitic infections when assessing vaccine efficacy, especially in regions where such infections are common. Yeah. It's, yeah, that's important. And also, <laughs> it's kind of funny because like here in the U.S., we don't do this, but I treat a lot of people from other countries. And in mm -hmm. other countries, it is so yeah. routine for people to just take an antiparasitic. Yearly. I know. Yearly. I know. And I have people coming in and they're like, they haven't been, you know, deparasitized. And then I'm like, what? I was like, and it took me a while to learn yeah. that in other countries, once a year, they just give you all bendazole and they just wipe right. out any parasites. Which I wonder it's, if it's something that we should do. Yeah. You know? I don't know. I feel like everyone should just take like a fecal test. Right? <laughs> <laughs> like, can you imagine if that like becomes like routine screening yearly? You have to well, give like a fecal sample. We had an episode where you went off on a hard tangent. Yeah, I did. <laughs> and I still will go off on a hard tangent of that girl. I know on TikTok. <laughs> yeah. That girl is like forever ingrained by her parasite dump story that she took at Target. I know. It. We didn't need to know. Yeah, I do not need to know that, madam. <laughs> It's so weird. People are so weird. Anything for the clown. For the clown and for the money. Yeah. All right. All you. Okay. So this is really cool yeah. and just really great news. I love it when we get things like this. A new painkiller could bring relief to millions without the addiction risk. Huge. Finally, something new in the world of pain medicine mm. by Marla Broadfoot on August 20th, 2024 on Scientific American. So Suzetrogene is a promising new pain medication that works by preventing pain signals from reaching the brain. 
Unlike traditional painkillers, which often have side effects or risk of addiction, Suzetrogene targets specific pathways in the nervous system to block pain more effectively and safely. This innovative approach could provide relief for people suffering from chronic pain conditions without the drawbacks associated with opioids and other common pain relievers. So obviously we're talking about addiction, constipation, all these things that can be negative with pain management. But researchers are hopeful that suzetrogene will offer a new and non-addictive option for pain management, potentially transforming how pain is treated in the future. Awesome. Yeah, this is really great. Pain is a chronic thing, yeah. right? Yeah. So it can be chronic. Yeah. Hopefully not for people, but unfortunately it can be. Mm. And it's really difficult to manage. And unfortunately, we're limited in the amount of things that we have. So it's just really a lot of times we do a lot of procedures and things like that to kind of like cut that pathway that may be leading to pain. So it's just really nice to know that we have another medication on the market that may treat it effectively and minimize the need for procedures, invasive procedures. We were just talking about it in our Patreon episode of Phantom Limb. Yeah. Check us out on patreon.com forward slash funny medicine podcast. Yes. Anyway, Um, so next one. More on Florida. This, this is another one that Mario sent me. And I, anyway, Florida, this is a very Florida man thing too, which is horrific. God damn it. Why do we always have to be on the wrong side of the news, man? (laughs) Anyway, so Florida doctor who didn't wear hearing aids during colonoscopy couldn't hear patient yelling. Who wait, who didn't wear hearing aids? Yeah, yeah. So he needed hearing aids and he didn't wear them? Just wait. My God. Just wait. State officials say by Tim Stello on August 20th, reported on NBC News. Dr. Ishwari Prasad, a gastroenterologist in Florida, has been placed on probation and fined $7,500 um, after two colonoscopy procedures. Two! Not a one, just two! And one awry due to his failure to wear hearing aids. This disciplinary action was taken by the Florida Board of Medicine following incidents at Tampa Ambulatory Surgery Center in June 2023. During one of the procedures, Dr. Prasad began inserting the colonoscopy scope before the patient was fully sedated, causing the patient to scream in pain. However, Dr. Prasad, who is hearing impaired, did not stop the procedure because he was not wearing his hearing aids, which are necessary for effective communication with his surgical team. This oversight is considered a breach of minimum professional standard of care. By the way, why? Because he's 80 years old. Okay, there's a lot of doctors that are older, right? And they're still doing their jobs and incredibly. But what the hell, man? How is it that you did not wear your hearing aids and you do not hear patients screaming? Hold. In another incident, on the same day, Dr. Prasad improperly delegated tasks to a surgical technician who is not licensed to perform such duties. This included tasks like inserting and manipulating the scope which should only be performed by licensed medical professionals. As a result of these incidents, Dr. Prasad is prohibited from performing gastroenterology procedures without supervision until he is evaluated for competency. He must also complete a five-hour course on medical laws, rules, and ethics. Dr. Prasad, who has been practicing medicine in Florida since 1990, did not respond to requests for comment on the matter. Dr. Prasad, come on, man. I mean, it's time. Yeah. And honestly, I don't think I don't think that this is something of competency. No. Okay. Like, how can I explain? Let me backtrack. I don't think that this is something of like knowledge. I think this is just pure negligence. Yeah. That you know that you have a hearing impairment. Yeah. Yeah. And you went to a surgery where you need to communicate with people and your patient. Your patient is freaking screaming. You're not listening because you weren't wearing your fucking hearing aids. Uh, It's 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 it's. I have no words. Yeah. And then delegating. I think that's just negligence. Yeah. And, that's just and, negligence. There's, and I feel like, like if there's an emergency yeah. and someone's trying to communicate with you, like, hey, the patient's not doing well, the patient's doing this, yeah. something like that. Then what? You're, what are you? What are you? La la land, you're just going to keep on going. And then delegating okay. the scope to be maneuvered by somebody that's not even licensed, mm-hmm. just like to whoever. Like, why are you even doing these procedures then? Yeah. Why? Bible, it's time to go. 
uh, uh, yeah, anyway. All right, so an evaluation of the nutritional and promotional profile of commercial foods for infants and toddlers in the United States. I'm sure you've seen this. Yes. So this is by Daisy H. Coyle and her friends, published on August 21st, 2024 on MDPI. This article examines the nutritional quality and the marketing of babies and toddler foods in the U.S. So nutritional compliance is one of them. Many products do not meet WHO nutritional guidelines. While some like dry cereals are compliant, snacks and finger foods often have too much sugar. Wow, I not can't believe it's taken, us, yeah, it's taken us this long. So many products used by use misleading marketing claims suggestive that they are healthier and actually um, are emphasizing natural ingredients or added vitamins. So again, this is like typical when people say, oh, but it's organic. And it's like, that doesn't mean that it's healthy. Mm. Uh, labeling and this marketing is so crazy. Mm. Using more modern colors and more, it's you know, just off everything. the psychology of just it. Just the psychology of it, yeah. exactly. Labeling issues, so ingredient lists and prep instructions often are really unclear and vague. Well, that can really be very confusing. Conclusion, the study calls for stricter regulations and clear labeling to ensure foods for young children are nutritious and marketed honestly, helping parents make informed choices. So we're going to tie in another article that just came out, uh, basically saying majority of baby foods in the U.S. grocery stores may not meet health guidelines. And this is also another study by, uh, this was published by Katie Kindelin and Sony Salzman on August 21st. And this was on Good Morning America. Mm -hmm. A recent study published in the Journal of Nutrients has revealed concerning findings about baby foods sold in the U.S. grocery stores. So the study examined over 600 products intended for infants and toddlers ages 6 to 36 months and found that about two-thirds did not meet the WHO standard, so the World Health Organization well, the, standard. The study you were just talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, for healthy baby foods. So specifically, 70% mm -hmm. of these products failed to meet protein requirements, 25% didn't meet caloric recommendations, and 44% exceeded the sugar limits with 74% containing added sugars or sweeteners. It's just... So that means that close to almost just 25% yeah. of the baby foods are going to be just without added like that crazy added sugar. Well, additionally, all the products had at least one misleading packaging claim not aligned with WHO standards. Snack size products were particularly low in nutritional compliance. Researchers are pretty much emphasizing the importance of incorporating whole foods such as grains, fruits, veggies into children's diets and caution against the over-reliance on packaged baby foods. Mm -hmm. so the U.S. Department of Agriculture also advises that infants and toddlers should avoid added sugars and consume a variety of non-processed foods. Go off. Oh, oh. my goodness. No, I mean, I don't even need to go off. It's yeah. like sometimes I just feel, don't get me wrong, I get it. I'm a parent. I know what it is that... And a pediatrician. And Yeah, and a pediatrician. I know what it is that you need like sometimes just like okay, quick and yeah. grab and go. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I feel I, I, I feel like it should be available to me yes, yes. to be able to go to the grocery store and be like, okay, I cannot cook at home, but I'm more than confident that if I walk out of my grocery store, I'm going to have something nutritious for my child. And this study is showing that when I go to the grocery store, I have to have my ass peeled for reading the nutritional labels, which yeah. I do anyways, but not a lot of people do. Because or have the time. Not, yeah, and, and, or the time. Yeah. Or probably just not the education. They yeah, get confused, the right? Well, I don't expect people to know how much fiber they need in for uh, a one-year-old. Yeah. Or even keep that. track of it. Or yeah. keep track of it. Sometimes they don't even know how. They get confused, and I totally get it. Yeah. So it's just really um, annoying that it's just, there's not like just an easier way for parents to be to say, okay, this has the recommended amount of protein and this and that. And then, okay, I think this is, you know, just an easier way to realize, okay, I think this is a healthy option. Or right? just have more of those healthier options available. Yeah. And the added sugar freaking kills me. Yeah. And don't even get me started on formula. Oh my don't God. Don't even get me started on formula. Oh my God. And the thing is that groceries these days are- And only... I'm not against the formula, but I'm against some of the U.S. formulas. Right. Yeah, which is why it's become popular now, the overseas formulas and stuff like that. I remember six years ago when my son was in that stage, having to drink milk all, all the time, it was just starting like the European formulas and all that because of yep. all these findings. But what's even more annoying is that we are paying an arm and a leg these days for groceries. Yep. And then it's for this. For this. For babies. The fuck? Yep. 
what are we paying for? We're paying for bullshit, you know, yeah. which goes back to all so many episodes that we talk about the food, the really the food in this country. But there's so and like much, a, you know, like, like that we say there's so much in marketing and all this stuff. Like how many marketing mm -hmm. companies are marketing <clears throat> vaping for teens? 100%. You know? 100%. So it's just, it's <clears throat> unfortunate it's a business. Yeah. But that's why I try as much as I can to educate, like, this is read the nutritional label, read the ingredients, like, yeah. you gotta look at it, okay? And that is, and, and I feel bad because some parents are like, I didn't know. Yeah. You know, like, oh, well, I got this yogurt and it has a baby face on it. Mm. So it must mean that it's for babies. <clears throat> I actually would understand that logical thinking. If you see a baby face, oh, this must be safe for babies. And when you look at the ingredient, it's like, you can give this starting at six months and it has 12 grams of added sugar. And I'm, oh, I'm just like, <sighs> yeah, why? Yeah, why? Yeah, exactly. All right, so next. Your brain may be mutating in a way that was thought to be very rare. So this is by Michael LePage on August 22nd on The New Scientist. So the article from The New Scientist discussed a surprising discovery about the human brain. It undergoes genetic mutations more frequently than previously believed. These mutations known as somatic mutations occur in individual brain cells and differ from inherited genetic changes. Although <laughs> such mutations were once considered rare, recent research suggests that they are quite common and may even play a role in brain development and function. Scientists are exploring how these mutations might contribute to neurological diseases and disorders. This new understanding challenges previous assumptions and opens up exciting avenues for further research into genetic complexity of the brain. Which is great because like, there's so many psychological and neurological uh, disorders and all that that develop later in your life and they're considered idiopathic. So maybe this is another way of figuring that out. Yeah. All right. So Musk's, as in Elon Musk, mm -hmm. um, Neuralink says second trial impl implant went well. So no thread retraction issue. So this is by Reuters on August 22nd, 2024. And then they by Reuters. It and published by Reuters yeah. on August 22nd, 2024. Elon Musk company Neuralink has announced the successful second trial of its brain implant technology. So if you guys just listen to our, I think like a couple of yeah. episodes in the past for one of our recaps, we mentioned that Neuralink, it's basically like almost like a chip that's inserted and then through your thoughts, you're able to move things, mm. which is really cool. Mm. But apparently that first trial didn't go too well. So they had a successful second trial of its brain implant technology, which aims to enable paralyzed patients to interact with digital devices using their thoughts. Mm -hmm. So the second patient identified as Alex did not experience the thread retraction issue that affected the first patient, Noland Abra, whose implant wires retracted post-surgery reducing the number of electrodes measuring the brain signals. So Neuralink addressed this problem by minimizing the brain movement during surgery and reducing the gap between the implant and the brain's surface. The implant has allowed both patients to engage in activities such as playing video games and designing 3D objects, showcasing its potential to improve the quality of life for individuals with spinal cord injuries. So it's so crazy. It's really cool. It's really cool. Yeah. Like what, what this has a potential of doing is, yeah. is wonderful. Okay. All right. So fluoride at twice the recommended limit tied to lower IQ in kids. U.S. report says. Yeah, this is a big news. Yeah, Mario sent me this one by Associated Press on August 22nd, published on MedPage today. Well, a new U.S. government report has found a link between high levels of fluoride in drinking water and lower IQ in children, marking the first time a federal agency has made such a determination. The report, released by the National Toxicology Program, reviewed studies from various countries and concluded that fluoride levels exceeding 1.5 milligrams per liter were consistently associated with reduced IQ scores in children. This finding is significant because fluoride, known for its role in preventing tooth decay, has been a major public health success since its introduction to drinking water. However, the report suggests that excessive fluoride exposure, which can come from multiple sources, including water, food, and dental products, like your toothpaste, poses a potential risk to neurological development. While the report does not specify how many IQ points might be lost, some studies indicated a decrease of two to five points in children with higher fluoride exposure. 
This has prompted discussions about the need for new fluoride limiting measures and the possibility of labeling fluoride content on beverages. Yeah, and I think some pretty big dental associations are still reviewing the research and everything behind it so that they can also make a really big recommendation. Because let's be real, the reason why we have fluoride and the reason why a lot of our dentition has improved is because of fluorinated water. Yeah. So it's not just because people are like, well, why do we have fluoride? Fluoride is actually important for our enamel and for our teeth. And when it was added, it actually showed a difference in our oral care Mm -hmm. just by having the amount in it. However, now they're kind of discussing how much should be in it and people should be aware if there is. Yeah. And the dental association still needs to kind of comment on that to see what their opinions are as well. Yeah, absolutely. So that was our recap. Yes. Thanks, August guys. Recap. We love our recap. Yeah. Yeah. Episodes. There was a lot. And that's filtering. I even filtered out ones I had here to talk about. Because, yeah. But it's just. But we truly love when y'all yeah. send us recommendations, like yes. articles and interesting things. So keep you doing can it. Email it, us, e- email it to us. You can post it up on our threads. We have yep. a lot of interaction on threads. Any, um, anything. Anything. You can just let us know and we'll, yeah. we'll be happy to include it and talk about it. Absolutely. And also don't forget to check us out on patreon.com forward slash 20 medicine podcast where we have how many? I think it's already. What was the last one? Over 50. Yeah. Full episodes. Yeah. Okay. So just like this full episodes over there that have nothing to do with the topics that we've touched upon in our weekly yeah. so completely brand new they come out every friday morning yeah just like these come out on every tuesday morning julie so, and i sometimes randomly will spice it up and show you guys a little bit of our patreon you. stuff just to give you a little taste of the patreon yeah so sometimes we will use our episodes to kind of you know promote that on our podcast but yeah we have over 50 of them already there and you could if you join you could listen to all of them and you'd also be supporting us to continue our you know, podcast going with this. But thank you guys for tuning in and we'll see you on the next one. See you later. Like, comment, review us on all streaming platforms, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, etc. Check us out on Instagram and TikTok at Funny Medicine Podcast. Our Gmail is at funnymedicine305 at gmail.com. And remember, we are not diagnosing you. Definitely not. Just funny stuff. See you later, guys.